So welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, Nassim Magdi for uh, your YouTube channel, Nassim Tron, uh, with our very special uh, guest, uh, Dr. Don Lincoln. Um, and actually, uh, I'm very happy to host him in the uh, in the YouTube channel. I should mention that um, one of my um, uh, like I would say I get uh, inspired by his uh, YouTube videos to to start mine. So it's a, a great uh, pleasure to to have you in the show. Um, and actually, uh, Dr. Lincoln, he's a senior scientist at Fermi Lab, um, America's flagship particle physics laboratory. Um, he has over uh, 30 years of experience exploring the most fundamental laws of nature. Uh, he has participated in some of the key discoveries of the last few decades, including the discovery of the top quark and the Higgs boson. Uh, he's an active writer about uh, scientific topics aimed at non-scientist uh, audience. He has written many books, uh, magazines, articles, and blog posts. He has contributed to CNN, NOVA, and Life Science. In addition, he used the power of the internet uh, to, bring, to bring engage video to broad audience. Uh, thank you so much for being here and welcome. Oh, I'm really glad to be here and I appreciate the invitation. Many question comes uh, from, I will say, non-scientist audience is why we should care about no information about physics. Why you guys are doing that effort of explaining the uh, complicated physics concepts to us? And what do you think about that? Well, there's actually a lot of answers to that question. And I, I typically use three. So the first one is the one that motivates me. And it is that the questions that we try to ask and answer using the types of physics of particle physics, cosmology, these complicated things, these are the kinds of questions that have bothered humanity since the beginning of time. Our very earliest writings ask questions about like, how did the universe come to be? Why is the universe the way it is? Could it be different? And I'm sure the, these questions actually predated writing. This is something that, that is intrinsic to our humanity. So um, even now, every year, every decade, every millennium, there are people who ask and want to know the answers to exactly these questions. So that's why I do this. I mean, these are what one might call philosophical questions or, or in the past were philosophical or even theological questions. But now we actually can measure things. We can look into the universe. We can look back in time by looking at more distant objects. We'll talk about that later. We can actually, um, in ex particle accelerators like I work at, we can collide matter together and recreate conditions that have not been present in the universe since a trillionth of a second after the universe began. So this is why we're doing it, because we are, we are part of a, a multi-generational journey where our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents ask these questions and every generation learns a little bit more. And hopefully someday in the far future, we will really be able to understand these, these deep questions that have bothered people for thousands of years. So that's the big, that's why I do it. Um, now for some people, they say, well, I don't care. You know, it doesn't help me play soccer better or football, I guess, sorry. Um, exactly. But, <laughs> But, you know, so why should I care? So then there is a couple of other questions. One, um, there are the possible future benefits. Now, I can't tell you what the future benefits will be for studying, for instance, the nature of matter at um, temperatures that are 100 times hotter than the center of the sun. I don't know if that will have a consequence. But what I do know is when we look in the past, things that seemed to have had absolutely no value turned out to be incredibly valuable. For instance, the electron was discovered in 1897. So this is over 120 years ago. And it seemed to have absolutely no use, use whatsoever. It was an obscure thing. It had something to do with uh, the, the building blocks of atoms. And that was all wonderful. But electrons is the basis of all of modern technology. Without electrons, we wouldn't have electricity. If we didn't have electricity, you and I wouldn't be able to communicate. And so this discovery that seemed to be pointless 120 years ago has revolutionized the world. So that is a, a, an example of why learning things that seem to have no bearing now will go from 
from exploratory knowledge to understanding knowledge to engineering to marketing to making money. So things like uh, playing Wordle or uh, watching things on the internet is all a direct consequence of someone playing around trying to understand the nature of matter. So that's a historical thing. Now, if you want to look at more recently, um, the research that I do does collide beams of particles together and recreate these very high energies. And some people say, well, that's fine. What people have done in the past has been helpful, but what have you done? And I don't know what consequences these collisions will have. But what I do know is that in order to figure out the answers to the questions that we want to answer, we have to develop new technologies. And I can give you two examples. Um, very powerful magnets are necessary to make these accelerators. Now, the way you make the most powerful magnets is you have to cool them to a very low temperature. And by cooling them to very low temperature, you can put a lot of electricity through the magnets. And by putting the electricity through the magnets, the magnets get stronger. This is called superconductivity. Now, particle physicists like myself did not invent superconductivity. But what we did do was industrialize it. So back in the 1970s, we decided to build a large particle accelerator outside of Chicago. And that needed to make a six kilometer in circumference ring of these magnets that were superconducting. And making magnets the size of my fist was something that people know how to do. But to build something this big took a lot of engineering, a lot of learning and development. So we did that, we built our accelerator. But that same technology then goes back into industry and was used to make uh, magnets for medical imaging. So if you're playing football or you twist your ankle as you get older or something and you have to go to the hospital and get an MRI scan to, to see what's hurt, that technology, the, these big magnets that you slide into was made by the industrialization of superconductivity. And superconductivity is another thing that is nearly a hundred years old. And then finally, the big thing that uh, um, that particle physicists take credit for, and it's true, is there are a few very large laboratories across the world. There's one outside Chicago. There's another one outside Geneva, Switzerland. And people go and work there, but not everybody can go work there. And so what has to happen is that there needs to be communication between people across the world. So if you come up with some sort of data and you wanna share it with your colleagues, it's very expensive to fly around and show it to people. But if you are able to communicate across the world, say you want to talk to um, Pierre in Paris or Dimitri in Moscow or Don in Chicago, how would you do that? Well, we developed a methodology for sharing data from computer to computer. And that methodology has evolved into being the World Wide Web. So the development of the World Wide Web has revolutionized commerce, it's revolutionized society. And it is the, the taxes paid in the commerce that has been genera generated by the web is more than paid for any particle physics experiment ever done. And so this is another case. So this is a long and disjoint answer because different people have different things that interest them, whether they are interested in the ultimate questions that interest me, or they're interested in more practical uh, you know, approach to science and a return on investment. There are answers for all of those people. So those are the reasons why it's important that we as a society continue to fund fundamental research because it's always paid off and I suspect it always will. I'm, I'm really happy to hear your answer. That's the question I had to answer all the time when I say like, you know, we're trying to look through the matter that's being created uh, like just right after the Big Bang, that's quark lone plasma. And everybody says, yes. okay, so what we gain out of that? From your answer right now, I can take two ways. One way, whatever we discover right now could be a, like a moderate change, a life change in future. And also we had to develop all of our technology to reach that discovery in the first place. So we benefit the community right now and we could change our future as the discovery of the electron that you, that you point us to. Um, in it, if I might add, in addition, something that people may forget is those developments that you just described, they're very important, but they are not done by computers, they're done by people. 
They're done by men and women who have to think about these questions. And the simple fact is that humans get older, they age, and we need a constant input of new and young people. So what answering questions like that, it's a incredible process of education so that new people come in, they solve these hard problems, they become experts at taking technology and converting it into something of value. And then many of them go off into industry and change their societies. So we cannot forget the, the huge value, the human potential of turning people who grow up knowing very little, ending up being world-class developers of technology. Thank you so much. I, I really find it. I think inspired by you, I started all of that and I hope to bring more knowledge to the uh, public audience and non-scientific communities. Uh, by the end, I would like to thank everybody that uh, watching this video and thank you all for being with us. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you very much.